Hi, I'm going to introduce myself in a moment and welcome everyone here. We want to give people a few more minutes to, to be able to sign in and figure out where we are. Uh, so sit back, relax. I'll be with you in a moment. Five minutes. It's going to ring. Three minutes. All right, I think we've waited long enough. Uh, welcome to the Oregon Jewish Museum and Center for Holocaust Education. It is an actual pleasure to be here in the museum and invite you in. Alicia Babstein and I are here today just in our office and it's been such a long time since we were at work. Um, especially together. Uh, I'm happy that you're here with us. This is the third installment in our occasional series of coffee and conversation where we're having staff members 
um, talk about something pertinent to them and hope that you all have questions and are interested in learning it. I'm going to talk to you today about some new acquisitions that we have just gotten. They came uh, just before we stopped being able to uh, to be in the museum, so I'm excited to have them unwrapped. Um, I hope that you will continue to come to the Coffee and Conversations. If you are on our mailing list, then you got an email talking about it. Uh, if you're not on our mailing list, go to the website and get on our mailing list. If you're a member, you get all kinds of other invitations. And if you're not a member, this is the perfect time for you to become one. We will appreciate you very much. Um, so I'm going to talk about a lovely collection of Judaica that was bequeathed to us 25 years ago, 26 years ago, and um, has just, just arrived at the museum. Um, most of the items in the museum's collection are artifacts and documents of Oregon Jewish significance. We have um, the collected materials of the Jewish experience in Oregon from 1848 until today. Personal papers, mementos, uh, diaries, clothing, jewelry, games, kitchen tools, uh, things from people's homes, as well as um, cash registers and advertising and record books from people's, from Jewish owned businesses in Oregon. Um, and items from this, the, the many synagogues in Oregon as well. But we also have a fine art collection that includes works by uh, Jewish artists abroad and domestic and um, works on Jewish themes. And we also have a Judaica collection and that's what is here today. Without our Judaica collection, we could only tell the cultural story about the Jews of Oregon. And um, we have an Objects in Jewish Life exhibit that allows us to introduce our visitors to a long history of Jewish artisans creating beautiful ceremonial objects. And um, you're going to get to see some today. Uh, Mira and Gustav Berger had this collection in New York and they understood long before we did how important it was going to be for the museum to have a Judaica collection. When they approached us in 1994, the museum was just five years old. We had no staff. It was a, an all volunteer run organization with a very strong board of directors. And they spoke with members of the board of directors and talked about this vision that they had for a time when the museum would be large enough to have a building of its own and a designated exhibit space for their, for their collection. And they knew that the size of the collection that they had would be just a drop in the bucket in New York at the Jewish Museum there, but it would be something really important for a museum just starting out here. Uh, they also had, had, a, had a son and grandchildren living in Portland and that helped them make their decision to donate the items to us. I wanna tell you a little bit about them. There they are. Um, wonderful people. We had a long relationship with them. Gustav, they were both Holocaust survivors. Gustav was born in Vienna and he came from a long line of art and um, antique collectors. Both his father and his grandfather collected art and antiques. His grandfather was the official advisor to Kaiser Franz Josef on the subject. Um, and Gustav himself began his career painting and had his first art exhibition in Vienna when he was just 18 years old. Um, when the Second World War uh, ended all of that, his family was dispersed, their items were stolen by the Nazis, and Gustav went to fight with the British Army against the, the Axis powers. After the war, he was stationed in Italy and he met Mira, who had survived the war. She, she was born in Vilna. Um, 
and they married in Italy and moved to Palestine to begin working for the liberation of the state of Israel from British rule. In 1946, they moved. Both their sons, Ron and Raphael, were born there. I'm hoping that at the end of this conversation that I'm, this not conversation that I'm having with you, that we'll have Ron um, join us from California and talk a little bit about his parents and about the collection. Hope you're out there, Ron. Um, in 1954, they left Israel and came to New York where Gustav began a very, very bright career as a, a painting conservator. He was well known for his inventiveness and tackled projects of scope and size, huge canvases that other conservators wouldn't touch. He invented some products that are still in use today. There's a product called Viva that's um, an adhesive that painting conservators still widely use and is, has wide acclaim from the field. Gustav died in 2006 and Mira started um, a fund here at the museum in his memory and in memory of their son Raphael that supports um, object conservation here. So if you're wondering what to do with your extra cash, the, the Gustav and Raphael Berger Memorial Fund would love to hear from you. Um, each year they sent us one or two of the pieces just to, to keep our relationship going. And um, I was lucky enough to visit them as was Judy Margles, our curator, because our lives brought us to New York frequently to visit and to work. Um, and we got to know them and cherished the relationship that we had with them. Their home was a museum filled with fine art and Judaica. In, and in the summer of 1994, my father and I went to, to visit and my father videotaped us while I talked to the burgers and they held up each one of these pieces and talked about them and what, what their reason for collecting them was and what was, in, what was interesting and important about them. They also gave us a wonderful list, the most carefully documented collection um, with a list of all of the items that we would be expecting. And Mira died in February of this year, and uh, we all grieved the loss of that long and, and close relationship. And then her son Ron and I began working out how the items would be packed up and moved to Portland. Uh, we have, you, you saw how they look on the table, all wrapped up in bubble wrap and, um, as soon as we are able, we're going to be sitting there and researching each one to, to do the cataloging for them. Uh, I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to show you some of the pieces now. Uh, they collected in, in, um, in categories. There were, there were some things that were just interesting to them and they tended to focus on them. One thing, one category that we have is amulets. I'm gonna hold this one up. This is a Middle Eastern amulet. Um, I, I will, an amulet is a talisman. It's a charm and have, has been part of the Jewish tradition for since, since the beginning. The Talmud is filled with, with references to amulets. There were rabbis who, who railed against them because of their connection with, um, with things magical and, and sorcery related, but they were rabbis who made them because they had to be experts in, in um, particularly in manipulating the name of God um, to, make, to make the amulets powerful. So this one is really, really special. Um, this is a framed amulet and I have a great photograph of it. So I wanna show you the photograph so you can see more. This amulet is based on the, um, the temple menorah. You can see the seven branched candelabra in the center. Um, and it is a prayer amulet meant to focus the, the person praying on, on their intention in prayer. All around the edges are um, quotes from from the Zohar, there are pieces of, of earlier Hasidic 
writings at the very top is the, the Tetragrammaton, the four letter name of God. And in the far right hand corner is the word Shviti, which is um, what we call this object because of that word. It's, it's called a Shviti. And that word means I have placed. It is the first word in verse eight, Psalm 15. I'm gonna read you the quote of verse eight. I have placed the Lord always before me. Surely he is at my right hand and I shall not be moved. So you can picture this in a synagogue setting or in a person's home where they do their daily prayers to help them focus their prayers. If you want access to it, let me know and um, we can do some research on it. Uh, another category of collecting that they did was on the ceremony of Havdalah. And um, it seems to have been um, a thing of, of great interest to Gustav. I remember him talking to me quite a lot about the ceremony. It is the ceremony practiced in the home where the family um, separates the, the past, the day of rest, the Sabbath, from the coming week ahead. Um, you, it is celebrated with smelling sweet spices, drinking wine, and lighting a braided candle, a many-wicked candle. Uh, it is a, a ceremony that includes small children, and for that reason, there's a lot of whimsy in the designs of of the pieces. I have some that I'll, sh I'll hold up and show you, and then Alicia is going to show you the photographs of them. This one, um, in the middle of the, of the um, 19th century, trains started to cross Central Europe, and um, this, this little guy rolls and has a place to attach, whoops, here you can see him, um, has a place to attach a string so a child can pull it on a string and the the filigree openings on the outside um, make it possible oh and now we have all the cloves coming out it's still got cloves in it um, make it possible to smell the sweet spices that are inside it um, this one personal favorite uh, the fish is uh, a symbol of fertility. A lot of the spice boxes use symbols of fertility again because children are there. We want to remind God to bless us with with many many children. Um, this this giant fish is loads of fun. He's got glass red eyes and movable scales. The smells can can come out through through his scales. And then if you if you break his little head down. Inside is where the where the spices go, and I'm gonna hold it up. I don't know if you can see it, but there's a Ten Commandments inside, with with the Hebrew letters marking the Ten Commandments. Um, so he is super special. Um, also, mid 19. I think this one is actually dated 1857, um, but you're gonna get to see a picture. And the last one is. Um, is one that Gustav talked to me about for quite a while. This is an example of, of Polish folk art and um, was interesting to him for that reason because it was, it, um, again, I'm going to show you as well as I can. It has lovely, whimsical little animals who are leaping and jumping um, on a background of flowers and vines there. But um, the thing that really stuck with me and a theme that seems to run throughout a lot of this collecting is um, the poor quality of the silver, that it's very low quality silver and it's very lovely work. And um, Gustav repeated several times this something from nothing idea that artisans at the time couldn't join the guilds, that they're non-Jewish, um, um, counterparts had established and so they didn't have access to the materials that that those people could get so they worked with inferior materials and still created these these exquisite pieces all right can we show the pictures of them so that you can see them up close there's the little train you can see the the beautiful looped filigree and the and the charming wheels and the 
the, the pipes and the fish. This is the second fish that we have from the burger collection. The first one is tiny, tiny, maybe six, you know, five inches long. It fits in the palm of your hand. And this one you saw is, is quite large. And here is the Polish pendant spice box. Now all of these um, would be filled with cinnamon and cloves, other spices also, and shaken and passed around to the family to smell sweet smells for the coming week. Um, let's go to the next picture. Um, this also for Havdalah is a combination spice box, candle, candlestick holder. It, it is truly amazing. Um, if you come back to me, I'll show you how it works. Um, again, not the greatest quality silver, but such clever work. It, the, the part that holds the candle is this flat oval, and I brought a candle so you can see how that works. The candle fits into it like this. And then as the wick burns, you can push it up and up so you can use till the very last bit of wick. And here on the side is a little drawer for spices. So this and a Kiddush cup and you're all set for your Havdalah celebration. Um, all right, so moving from the home to the synagogue, we have um, these Rimonim that are the Torah finials that go on top of the two staves on which the Torah scroll is wound. They are, again, they are not the finest silver. They are, they're brass and they're silver plated. And they were sold, I love this, because so many of the pieces, all of the pieces that they bought came with, with appraisals and they were, they were advertised as being what they are. And Gustav, being an expert in his field, knew them to be something else at times. So these were advertised as ivory and silver. Um, and Gustav did a little research into them and found that they are instead brass and galalith, which is early, early plastic. It's a plastic from around the same time as Bakelite was invented. Um, in, that's late 18th century, right? right around the turn of the 19th century. Uh, it's made from the protein casein, the milk protein casein. And you can see that it looks like ivory. Some differences that he pointed out to me were that ivory is, um, has a grain to it. It's because it grows on an animal. It, it, has, a, it has a grain, um, fine lines in it. And these are, are completely solid. They're also identical. They are, they, should, he, he said they're, they're cast, they're both right hands, and, and they're cast in a mold. So um, we have them accurately described now, and I, they are certainly no less valuable for, for having been misidentified. Um, okay, next, we're moving on. Probably, did I say my favorite before? Because I have a lot of favorites in this collection, but this one is one that he, they, I saw this 25 years ago in their apartment and I honestly, I have been waiting 25 years for this to come to the museum because I love it. This is also Galilee and it was also advertised as being ivory. It is um, inscribed, it is um, etched there on the top. You can see that is the prayer that um, the Moyal says during a child's circumcision. And this is, this is the box, which is so great. All of these little Galilee handled things, a little scalpel, a circumcision shield, little shears, and a tiny little container that opens that I assume had ointment um, in it. And not going to be in use anymore but definitely going on exhibit the minute that we can that we can add it to our objects in jewish life exhibit um all right this one is very special too is this our last thing oh i forgot one thank you uh let me go back to it um this we this was we were supposed to 
to be doing. This is home and synagogue. Hard to know which this one was used for, although I'm guessing it was home um, because it's got this small size and I would think that the synagogue tzedakah box being filled by more than one, one family would be filled faster. Um, this is a box for collecting coins for charity uh, daily during the morning prayers and on Friday night before lighting the Sabbath candles. Uh, coins are put into it. Um, and then when it's emptied, the coins are given to charity. Uh, what is special about this one is the, you can see at the top, the little latch that opens and closes and a place for a, a padlock to go on it. Um, the lovely rampant lions, rampart lions there around the, around the um, tablets with the crown. And then on the back, a little handle for carrying it around. And if you look carefully at that picture, it is also interesting that the back has been, the, the, the space behind that handle has been meticulously rubbed clean. It had an inscription on it that we will never know because whoever sold it didn't want us to know what family it had come from and the, the inscription has been rubbed off of it. So um, loving, loving the design on it. All right, last object. And then you get to ask all the questions you want. This is an example of Bohemian um, ruby flashed glass. It is the third piece of ruby flashed glass that, that we've gotten from the Berger collection. Absolutely love it. Early 19th century. And, oh, no, 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 no. Yeah, early 19th century. That's what it is. Um, and you're, I'm going to have to show you them in the photographs because you can't see them. There are tiny, tiny little paintings, tiny miniature portraits that go around of six well-known uh, rabbis of, of different periods. The two that I want to point out to you are the first two. That is the Baal Shem Tov there, the founder of the Hasidic movement, um, Polish rabbi, um, Hard to, hard to overstate his, his influence on Jewish life in Eastern Europe and into our own lives. And then the next one is his major opponent. This is Eliyahu Hagon the Vilna, the Vilna Gaon, who was the most outspoken um, opponent of the Hasidic movement and started schools um, to, to teach orthodoxy and, and stay away from the spiritual revival movement of the Hasids. The Hasids were, were teaching personal revelation and, um, and teaching that, that every Jew had the same access to personal revelation and a, and a one-to-one -one relationship with God that um, they and downplaying the importance of studying Talmud, which obviously the Vilna Gaon and and most Jews at the time thought that that studying Talmud was the most important thing. So here are the others. They are I'll just read them because you can't really see them. Uh, Zvi Ashkenazi, Yonatan Evishitz, Moshe Sofer, and Akiva Eiger. Um, and if you want to know more about them, much research has to be done on this little piece too. I want to know why these six, why they were chosen and, and how these little, little um, portraits were done. So anybody want to come and do research with and for me, you're welcome to come on and do that. We have a lot of work to do on this collection. So I think the first thing we'll do is bring Ron up and talk to him. And then uh, if you put, there's the question and answer part on your screen. If you would put questions in the question and answer place, then Alicia can read them to me and we can do it. So Ron, are you there? I am, how are you, Ann? Well, I have not seen you in such a long time. Way too long. How is California? Uh, it's gonna be 115 here today, so uh, warm. <laughs> 
Well, it is so nice. And thank you so much for making this happen. Oh, my pleasure. It's really all my parents. And all the wrapping up and worrying that you did about these pieces en route must have been terrible. Well, that was actually my son, Josh. He, uh, he was very, he, he was there, of course, for the service. And uh, the very next day, we were trying to think, what do we do here? And and uh, we decided the most important thing was to get those objects packed up and out of there because, well, it turned out we didn't know COVID was coming, but, uh, but yeah. luckily, luckily we shipped it because uh, we're still paying rent on that apartment and all the other art objects are sitting right there because the building will not allow us to even bring movers in there. So, oh no. So four months later, we're still stuck with, uh, with all the art there's objects, some, there's except some yours. Art there. Judy yes. was telling you that one of the stories that your dad told her was that sometimes when he did conservation work for an artist, he would get paid with a painting. And that some Absolutely. of the work on models came from, from um, the artists who he was working for. Um, so I Many times. And, uh, and uh, my father, just a quick thing to your uh, comment, to your, to your comment there. My, uh, my father was never about the money. And uh, so you may be familiar with Paul Jenkins, uh, as an American artist, and uh, uh, Jenkins' typical painting is the size of an entire wall. Yes. Uh, 20 feet, 30 feet. Anyway, my father saved one of his paintings for him. Uh, it had been damaged in a flood. Anyway, he, uh, he saved it. And uh, uh, Jenkins uh, said to him, take anything you want, anything in my entire um, you know, collection here. And my father looked at these pictures. <laughs> <laughs> mostly would not even fit in his apartment and he ultimately chose one that was about three feet by five feet and said I'll take this one because I think I can find a spot for it so uh, yeah <laughs> how did you start a quarter million dollar quarter million dollar error <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I wanted to ask about growing up in that apartment surrounded by art and Judaica and was it, was it a part of your life? Did you go to auctions with them? Did they talk art at the dinner table? You know, they didn't, and no, I didn't. Um, so, you know, my, my uh, parents were both very much um, victims of the war, of course. Uh, my mother's entire family was uh, killed. She was the only survivor. Um, and uh, she came from a family of educators. Both her parents were teachers, and she became a teacher. And in fact, uh, her first job in New York when, when they arrived was uh, as a Hebrew teacher in Ramaz uh, school where she taught for many years. And my father, on the other hand, was exactly the opposite. He grew up in a very wealthy family um, where uh, his father, as you said, was the art dealer to the throne of Austria. And, um, and, and thanks to that cash, uh, um, as soon as uh, Hitler began his march across Europe, um, my grandfather sent all three of his kids, one of which, of course, was my dad, uh, out of the country. And my father immediately went to um, uh, England, signed up for the British Army, where he was assigned to uh, fight in Africa against Rommel. Uh, so, but the war really, um, uh, they, they never forgot it, and um, it affected... Uh, um, really much of what they did. So the Judaica collection um, was all about um, having gone through a war in which sacred items were melted down to make bullets, um, led them to collect this, um, to, to create this collection. Wonderful. That they certainly shared with us. Do you have favorites among the collection? Oh, I think the fish that uh, you have there was always my favorite, so. Pretty swell. Yes. <laughs> that guy. Uh, when you moved from Israel to New York, your grandfather was in New York. Did you, did you know him well? Did he, did, was he a I, part of I met him once or twice, and sadly he passed away within six months of our arrival in New York, so. Oh, no. Had he restored his collection at all? Did he continue collecting once he left Europe? Um, they did continue collecting. And uh, in fact, uh, uh, they uh, gave us uh, children a number of their uh, art objects over, over the years as gifts for, you know, anniversaries, weddings, births, whatever. Um, and uh, 
I took uh, one actually to um, the the um, Antiques Roadshow was here in Palm Springs one year, it's about 10 years ago. And so uh, I thought it would be fun to go over there and see what they thought. And I took this piece over there and, uh, and they actually recorded me. So if you ever see the, the part, the uh, Palm Springs version of the Antiques Roadshow, I'm on there with this Mayan head, which wow. uh, my grandfather, um, um, when he left Europe, took this, uh, and half a dozen art objects. I've now got several of them here at, uh, at our place. And, um, and uh, so I'm really glad he did. But no, almost everything. Unlike the, um, the, the movie with the, um, oh, the Woman in Gold, uh, which starts off with scenes in a, an apartment in Vienna that to me looked exactly like our apartment in New York, which it means that- All over the walls. Yeah, and the furniture, all the Biedermeyer everywhere, which which means that my dad grew up that way, which was no surprise, and tried to repeat it in New York at, at his place. Um, so, uh, but unlike the woman in gold, uh, virtually all the things that they owned were stolen and never recovered. Right, I think that the majority of the items were never recovered. It's it's unusual to hear the stories about them being found. Yeah, uh, I, and I in a lesson. Okay. I'm sorry, and in, in a lesson to uh, all of all the folks on the call who uh, who uh, have safe deposit boxes, you know, my my dad uh, was uh, uh, very proud to tell me repeatedly during while I was growing up that um, <clears throat> in um, during World War II that his dad had um, uh, deposited gold coins in safe deposit boxes all over the place, especially in Swiss banks, of course, because of how safe they were. And that um, I, he gave me detailed instructions on how to go back and get the gold out of these boxes after he passed. Yeah. Well, when the bankers tell you that the account was closed 20 or 30 years ago and that um, there is no such account, what do you do? So, as I say, a lot of the art was stolen, so it was lots of gold and everything. Money, sure. I want to turn it over and see if people have written in um, and see if Alicia, I see that there are some chats and some Q and A's. Yeah, we do have just, we have a couple questions and we have time for just a couple questions here. Uh, so question, the first question is, this is for either Anne or Ron. Did Mira or Gustav ever say uh, what their prized object was that they collected? Their favorite object that they collected? Not to me. Not to me. There were so many, I mean, they're, it probably changed often. No, you know, um, I don't have it here and I uh, um, will have to be vague because I don't remember the details, but my father was proudest of uh, restoration work that he did uh, where, as Anne pointed out earlier, where, where something would go on auction and he would right away recognize that they were mistaken, whoever owned it, that they just didn't understand what they even had. Well, so he gets a painting one day uh, to restore. And the painting is a Christian religious scene. And uh, he starts working on it and he very quickly realizes that there's an un so-called underpainting or this, what he was staring at was an overpainting, what's called an overpainting, meaning there's a whole nother painting underneath it. So he goes to the person who owns it and says, there's a painting underneath this. Oh, we're losing you, Ron. Uh, either, uh, I said, he said, she, sorry. He said, I, I have no idea what's gonna be under there. Or you can tell me to just restore it to its current condition and I will. And instead, the guy who owned it just said, well, why don't you just take it, take it, I'll, I'll give me a couple of grand. And, and he sold it to him. Well, my father painstakingly over the next few years removed the entire overpainting and underneath it was a Spanish Inquisition Jewish religious painting wow during the inquisition whatever family owned it realized that jewish paintings would get you killed and so they totally painted this christian scene on it so th those were the kinds of things he was proudest of that is a pretty great discovery uh next question uh, i think we'll do one or two more depending on how long the answer is so the next question is um 
how do you clean the silver? Uh, does it get polished? Uh, is it ever used again for uh, any actual purposes or is it always just on display? I, I can answer that one. I don't know how, how collectors clean their silver when they have a collection, but I know how museums do it and we don't polish our silver. Um, if it comes to us polished, then we, then we keep it that way. But the polishing process removes, um, removes particles of silver and we don't want to do that, especially in the case of these pieces that are already low quality silver. We clean them and we keep them tarnish free. We clean them with, a, we have a, um, a recipe for a, a combination of calcium carbonate and denatured alcohol and gloves. Um, and very soft cloths, and um, and so all of these pieces, well, they'll you know they're all going to be touched during the research process, hopefully with gloves on, and we're going to to have them out and working on them for quite a while, and then once they are ready to go on exhibit or into storage and not be not be seen, we will clean every one of them very very carefully, and then in storage they are. They're in air-free plastic and and in a in a foam cut container so that they won't be touched. So then they don't have oxygen or um, or tarnish already on them. So I can give you that recipe if you want to contact me. All right. I think our last question here is just one um, again for Anne. Uh, we someone is curious why you like the circumcision kit so much. Is does it have particular historic significance? Is it rare? Or is there something else that you are connecting to with it? I think what I love about it is that it's plastic, that it's it's early, early plastic. And it's this new technology that was used to make a, an ancient object. And it's so much more common to find, to find silver ones. It's very common to find silver or tools in a wooden box. But the fact that, that this was made, oh, and I forgot to mention to you that um, it's tricky. It's this, this Galilee was, was poured in, in very, very careful thin layers so that it looks like it has a grain. Somebody really wanted this to look like it was ivory, um, which to me is just special, the, the amount of time and care that went into it. We have a second, um, a second, um, Brit Mila set that that arrived also in this collection that is silver and it is very special too because it's not just a silver box it is designed it looks like a little settee it's a little couch with pillows that um, that the baby would have been put on well I mean a, a replica of what the baby is put on for the circumcision so that was I we don't want to look at those chats Oh, we don't. Oh, we don't have time. Alicia is saying we're all done. Ron, thank you so much. Um, thank you. Again, come to Portland as soon as people can visit, and you'll see we're going to we're going to do a little display and look forward to it. Parents, I'm sure I'll be in touch with you. And thank right. everyone for coming again. Thank you. Join the museum. Come to more of our virtual events, and once we open, come to our our actual events. Bye. Thank you. Bye.